The Bible tells us, if we went back to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, unto us a child is born. That's the babe born in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Unto us a son is given. Jesus was the eternal Son of God, and he came into this body that was given him. The Catholics talk about the mother of God. Well, isn't Jesus God? Yes. But you're not the mother of God. He is eternal. God was around a long time before Mary came on the scene. She is the mother of the body that was prepared. And you could go to Hebrews. It quotes the Psalms. A body hast thou prepared me. Four facts. Born of a woman, virgin woman, in the town of Bethlehem before 70 A.D. Many of my Jewish friends that I speak with say, yeah, but you take those prophecies and in light of Jesus, you change their understanding. The Jewish people never understood that to mean that God was coming in human flesh. Who else was a man born of a virgin in Bethlehem before 70 AD? Who are we looking for? If it's not Jesus, who else is there? Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. What did Jesus say? If son of man is just simply, well, this just means I'm a human being. If that's what it means, then why did they understand this as blasphemy? Because of the text that Jesus had just quoted of himself. He quoted from Psalm 110. There, Yahweh says to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This uh, exalted being, Jesus was identifying John chapter as one himself. is another very important section of scripture. It illuminates the incarnation of Jesus as fully God, fully man. Well, what John's going to do is he's going to take this concept of the Logos, the word, and in so doing, he's going to take the essence of Jewish thinking and the essence of Greek philosophy, and he's going to bring it all together into Jesus Christ. The Word was with God. So the Word is eternal and with God. Literally, it means face to face with God. And the Word was God. So this, this eternal Word that's face to face with God is God. We're getting a picture here of the Trinity eternal and is God. It's talking about Jesus. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in this world. As you can see, this is the last day, official day of the Theological Conference for 2023, the year of our Lord. Today is May 7th. So that was the schedule we had starting Friday. Today, obviously, is Resurrection Sunday, as we meet traditionally, first day of the week that the Messiah was raised from the dead by God the Father. So we have this morning a faith story for you. And then we have Pastor Dennis Baldwin. And as is the tradition of the conference, the pastor is closing with a sermon. 
So we thank him ahead of time for all his work and dedication. <clears throat> and then at the end, we will have Anthony give a closing remark and close with prayer as well. And we actually will start, obviously, opening with prayer. And if you're new to this, uh, to this uh, recording, to this meeting or this church, Sunday church, we open up with the Shema. Shema is a Hebrew word that means to listen or obey. And it comes from Math, uh, Mark 12. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, let me read some of it. So one of the scribes, that is Jewish scribes, came near and heard uh, Jesus disputing with other people as usual. And the scribe asked Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus said, the first is here, that is that word Shema in Hebrew, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, your strength. And the second, Jesus said, is to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to Jesus, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one. And besides him, there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that this rabbi answered wisely, Jesus said to the rabbi or the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. <clears throat> now, the reason Jesus said that is because in Judaism, which is the faith of Jesus, this declaration that the one God of Israel is one individual, one non-human person, obviously, who Jesus calls repeatedly the Father, um, that declaration gets you close to the kingdom of God. And the ancient rabbis used to call the Shema, this declaration, as the yoke of the coming kingdom. <clears throat> and by that, the Jews understood the kingdom as the restoration of the Davidic kingdom that once was. And obviously, it will come in a greater form with a greater uh, king, kingly figure, a descendant of David. They called the Messiah, the anointed one of God. So <clears throat> that's why we, every morning in, a, in our Sunday online services, we start with this declaration as our starting point for our prayers. Mm -hmm. So let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you for this time and the opportunity to continue to do this. The technology, we thank you for the presenters this year. We pray for this fallen world, Father, the um, <clears throat> latest massacre here in the U.S. yesterday that we heard about once again. Uh, just evil sh shootings and debauchery and murders that continue unabated on a daily basis. Uh, whether it's one victim or ten, it's just horrible. So we pray for the families, for people connected to the latest tragedy, not just here but around the world. We pray for your kingdom to come, Father, and for you to send your son soon. We know many things have yet to happen, but we have this hope that one day you will be good to your word, Father. And uh, we thank you for Dennis ahead of time. We once again thank you for all the presenters this year. We thank you, of course, for Anthony. And we pray for our families, our fortunes, and our health as well, and our little church here in Fayetteville. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All righty. So we will start 
with a faith story and this is Bob Schutz. Schutz and I have been a Christian since I guess it's about 1975 so I'm slipping up on 50 years. I'm a retired pastor. I founded a church in Cloquet, Minnesota that's still there. My wife and I have been married 50 years. I have five children. Variously at different times in my life I have uh, been a pagan uh, when I was much younger. Uh, I think I was a Trinitarian for a while as a child. In midlife, I embraced and belonged to the uh, Oneness Pentecostal movement through the United Pentecostal Church. And ultimately, through the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God, came to an understanding of the Father and the Son that is wonderfully harmonious with Scripture and uh, deeply satisfying and doesn't require any strain to reconcile it with the scripture uh, my my story i as 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 much as uh, i can remember at this age i'm 74 now is that as a child i remember clearly thinking that there just had to be more to life than what i was just seeing on the face of things i mean clearly more than what we saw on television. So a child, you're you know, watching TV shows, you know, Lone Ranger and Zorro, and Ozzy and Harriet, and all those things. And I, and I thought, you know, there's just got to be more to life than uh, what's in front of me. And it seemed very important to me as a child, make a decision about how important is this, this uh, stuff with God? Would you follow it all the way? What, what, if, what if you had to sometime possibly suffer for your faith? Would you be willing to do that? Uh, it was important to me as a, as a child. I think God works with children and uh, strives with children because we're open when we're kids and of such is the kingdom. Well, anyhow, as, uh, as a young man went through high school and early in college, a good student, but a pretty reckless kid, got engaged at the uh, University of Michigan with the uh, entire counterculture, a radical, rock and roll, drug-infused, pagan lifestyle uh, of the hippie kind of movement and ended up uh, going to Woodstock with some friends, found it all empty. And then ultimately, uh, I left uh, Ann Arbor and went to the Upper Peninsula where I, I met my wife. I, I was a ski instructor at a, uh, a ski resort in uh, northern Michigan and I met my wife. We eventually became married and it dawned on me that in spite of having a home and a job that paid pretty well and a, a pretty wife, she's cutie and great cook. Besides all that, she's a great cook. I was empty and uh, profoundly empty. And I had searched around a little bit, you know, and, and uh, uh, things like silver mind control, I guess that would, that would kind of qualify as uh, science of the occult and, and uh, when the time came and i was considering you know what, what's it all about again you, know, you spend a lifetime considering those kind of things i was in madison wisconsin uh, one of the other ski instructors at the resort that i worked at had a pottery shop in madison wisconsin and he said you know bob you ought to come down and see my shop, give you something to do for a couple of days in the summer. So I thought, you know, Tom, I'm gonna do that. So I went down to Madison, Wisconsin, and I had a very profound religious experience there. And it was completely unexpected and not something that I was really even looking for. But I was, I was walking uh, along a park kind of an area uh, above the lake uh, in Madison. And there was a uh, group of, I guess, sort of, you'd call them my compatriots, you know, some counterculture, long hair type, tie dyed shirt group, brown rice, the whole thing. There was a young man who was trying to witness to them, and he was doing his best to explain the gospel to these folks, and they were laughing him to scorn. They were mocking him. And I was not a Christian at the time, but I do remember being offended with the behavior of these people who would take this well-intentioned and maybe misguided young fella, uh, but taking this well-intentioned man and just laughing him to scorn, that really offended me. And it dawned on me in that moment that I thought I'm with him. 
And I, I wish I'd had the courage to walk up to that group and tell them to leave the poor guy alone. I didn't, but I walked away, but it made an impression on me. I think at that time I sort of changed sides. A few years later, uh, maybe four or five years later, after I was married, I was on a business trip down to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and in the middle of a conversation about politics and the Vietnam War and all the cultural things that were happening, uh, a young fella, I think he's cut from the same cloth as the guy that was uh, addressing that group of hippies down in Madison, uh, walked into the middle of the group and looked at me and said, yeah, but what about your salvation? Well, at that time, all the people that I was with, they, uh, they thought, uh oh, here's a religious kook. Let's get out of here. And so suddenly I was left alone with this fella who was witnessing about the second coming of Christ and about baptism and about Pentecostalism. And uh, I, I was just fascinated. And I thought, talk all night long, which in fact is what happened. I think we talked until three or four in the morning. And uh, I thought, I have, to go, I have to go find some place where I can be baptized. I, I'm in. And um, ultimately ended up in a United Pentecostal Church in Duluth, Minnesota. Totally dedicated, served as their youth pastor, director of evangelism, and uh, was just telling everybody I could think of about this God of ours. And after a while, I began to get disenchanted with the whole oneness Pentecostal, uh, not only its legalisms, but its brittle theology that to me was just as distorted. I knew that the Trinity was not true. I knew that because I had read the Bible through cover to cover enough times to say it's just not in there. That's not what it's trying to say at all. And I knew that the Trinity was a, a distortion like, like this. It was, it was curved. But oneness theology was curved the other way. You know, one is the, I'm trying to get my hand in there. One is theology was convex and Trinitarian theology is concave. They were just distortions in opposite directions, but they both had problems. And uh, ultimately I left, uh, my wife and I had gone to a little town called Cloquet and established a church there, which thank God is still there today. I'm in uh, regular touch with the pastor who was my assistant while we were working to establish the church. That took about 20 years. And uh, today we are still in touch uh, just about every week. Uh, John is uh, the webmaster on my uh, website, theologyallstars.com and, and uh, wonderfultheology.com. So we're still in touch you know, with that, with our group and with John. And, but personally, I think I wandered, just wandering because I, I couldn't find anybody or anything that really resonated with me and made sense biblically that that would square with the scriptures about who is Jesus and who is God and how's all this fit together and then ultimately I was looking online at books about uh, church history and things because the interest never went away uh, when I was a kid I always thought well maybe someday the adults some adult some wise person will step into my life and explain what there is more than what we can see and of course, that was just a child's dream. It never really happened. But as I was searching uh, as an adult, I, uh, I ran across Richard Rubenstein's book on when Jesus became God. Now, the title fascinated me. I thought that's a great title. You know, the controversy over Christ's divinity in the final years of the Roman Empire. And I thought it was really a fascinating historical read because number one, Richard Rubenstein uh, not being a Christian, he has a Jewish background, uh, essentially did not have a dog in the fight, you know, in the doctrinal fights that plagued Christianity. He, he was not a part of that. So he, he could report dispassionately. And it was fat. by the way, if you've never read Richard Rubenstein's book, you want to get it. But as I was purchasing Richard Rubenstein's book, I also saw on Amazon another title that got my attention, and it was called The Doctrine of the Trinity, Christianity's self-inflicted wound. And I guess it, and that was by Anthony Buzzard, who I've since met and is a wonderful gentleman, wonderful Christian man. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna get that book too. And it, it was life-changing. Uh, began to see and understand things and scripture began to just click into place. Things just began to compactly fit together wonderfully. Uh, I especially remember the, 
the uh, treatment that in his book he he gives to uh, Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord about Adonai and Adonai, and uh, that that was just magnificent. And I I realized that I endorsed this biblical Unitarian message uh, that people have labeled different things over the centuries. Some have said it was Socinian, or you name name whatever label you want to put on it. But the essential message was that there was one God, one invisible, immortal, eternal, infinite God, and that his son was Jesus Christ, virgin born, and his only begotten son. I just, you know, that's comprehensible, ultimately. It didn't have all the theological problems and distortions of oneness or the Trinity. It simply made sense to me. And uh, since that time, uh, I have been trying to share that understanding with uh, people that I know, my son, my daughter, my friends, former assistant who's the pastor of the church in Cloquet, and others who are, uh, and I think a growing number of people are coming to the understanding of who Jesus is as uh, we do our best in our feeble ways to express it. So these days I'm content with the understanding that God has given me. I wish I could do a better job of explaining it, and I write about it all the time. So please, if you get a chance, come visit my websites. And that is Bob's one of Bob's websites. Thanks, Bob, for that. <clears throat> and uh, it's called theologyallstars.com. And it has a lot of humor. So it's a humorous website. Um, so and it has a uh, studies as well the other one is wonderfultheology.com <clears throat> and there's bob and a lot of good resources there too so uh yes so give your support there to bob shoots thanks again bob for that faith story Okay, so as I said, we are coming upon the 10.30 mark, 10.30 a.m. Pastor Baldwin will close the official theological conference for this year. Uh, before then, let me share some of the correspondence we get at, at the top here be, so I can give the floor to the pastor. And uh, we get comments on our YouTube channels. By the way, um, if you did not, were not able to watch some of the conference live, go to the links up here, as you can see, click on videos. You should be able to see the focus on the kingdom video uh, channel, sorry, I should say. And uh, just go to videos and there are copies of the last two days. Yes, Friday and Saturday. And also you can click on live if you see there, and that's the full live broadcasts, including the church Sunday Bible studies, by the way. So click on live and you should be able to get the full unedited, uh, the raw footage of the live stream. So click on live. I just learned that the other day, actually. All right, so we get many comments, of course. We have, uh, look at that, we have, we just passed 13, uh, hold on, 13,000 subscribers, if you can see at the top there. So if you have not subscribed, by the way, please click on subscribe. So we passed 13,000 subscribers and four and a half thousand videos since 2010, I believe, we started this channel. So thanks for your support out there. And uh, here are some of the comments on the many Yahwehs of James White and Trinitarians. Great questions. Love your channel and the work you do for the kingdom. It's good to push back against people like James White and the three who's one what doctrine. Reducing God to a mere stuff or what does not seem biblical at all to me. I feel like there's a false equivocation in how they're using the term God when they refer to the persons and how they use it differently when referring to the, quote, stuff. <laughs> Jesus is made of the same stuff as the Father, 
doesn't really explain as much as they think it does. <laughs> On one of the Q and A's, we have a Q and A by the way every month. Uh, Anthony and myself, so be on the lookout for that so we just started may so we'll be doing a q a so you usually in on friday love to start by anthony god cannot die because if he did then he wouldn't be god at all isn't that true sin and death can never ever be associated with him it is blasphemy to say that god died his son did not god don't understand why people try to complicate God Almighty and Jesus. On how many persons is God? Uh, a debate Anthony did some years ago now with, unfortunately, an ex-Unitarian uh, fella, ex-non-Trinitarian, now Trinitarian, unfortunately. Awesome work, Sir Anthony. You convinced me to change my Trinitarian view to become a convinced Unitarian. God bless you. So there are benefits to debating, by the way. Uh, I know it's not for everyone, but, you know, we throw out different um, tackles out there, different baits, if you will. On a video on a reading of Dr. Colin Brown's article, Trinity and Incarnation. Just came across this video, great information. On why did Jesus claim to have come down from heaven? Those verses in John chapter three and six. I love how both Sir Anthony and Carlos explained these verses, but I think most of the, of the world believe in the preexistence of Jesus in heaven. They believe he created all things, so they believe he is God, the Lord. I do not believe in the Trinity. I think it's confusing and takes away the perfection and completeness of God, our Heavenly Father, and this is by no means disrespecting Jesus, his position and what he has done and will do for mankind. He is our king and the only rightful king. Anyway, thanks for this and look forward to more. Carlos' debates are excellent. <clears throat> on a video I did on Michael Brown, or against Michael Brown, I should say, spot on, it's amazing how, quote, convincing Brown sounds to the ignorant <laughs> of both Hebrew and English grammar until the obvious is stated. <laughs> yes. uh, let's see. On a video on the one, 144 144,000. I cannot wait until we are all in the millennial kingdom and we can all discuss about how much confusion there was around the number 144,000. Oh, it's funny. Yeah, I cannot wait. Uh, let's see. On a Trinitarian corruption in 1 Corinthians 8 6, another amazing piece of detective, detective work. Amazing stuff. Uh, so that's good. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Those comments are great. They uh, give us a, a lot of support. Uh, it's unbelievable support for all the work here. So, alrighty. So let's see. We're almost at the ten thirty mark. So I'll, I'll introduce. Pastor Baldwin. So if we go back to the theological conference, click on presenters, and these were our presenters for this year. And he's number one there. So I'll just read his bio. For 30 years, uh, he pastored at Grace Fellowship Church of God in Front Royal, Virginia, and also in Illinois, North Carolina. Dennis was mentored by Pastor Z.B. Duncan in Lenore, North Carolina, and by the Church of the Resurrection Hope, Elders and Leaders. He is licensed and ordained by his home church in North Carolina, by the Southeast Conference of the Churches of God, and by the Church of God General Conference. And Pastor Baldwin, as you can see his sermon this morning, look what's coming down the road. <laughs> Good morning, Pastor. Good morning. Good morning. What a How beautiful are you? So, 
<laughs> so you have a PowerPoint and I'll help you with that. Okay. So just let me know when you're ready and I'll put it up for you. Okay, we'll start out on slide one if we can. Okay, guess guess what is coming down the road? Guess who's coming down the road? And uh, that we know is going to be our wonderful Lord and Savior, our Messiah, if you will. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of Amos' statement in uh, chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? We have many prophecies in the Bible that we need to know about that tells us something about who, what's coming down the road. Slide two, please. My name is Dennis Baldwin. I'm 77 years old. Uh, my wife, Rachel, and I now live in Hudson, North Carolina, in the area which I like to call the land of my nativity. Rachel and I have one adopted son, Tony. Uh, I was ordained by the Southeast Conference of the Church of God in 66, and by the Church of God in 68. I received a certificate of high school equivalency in the state of North Carolina in 66, and an associate's in accounting degree from Lord Fairfax Community College in Virginia in 1993. I began my first pastorate in 1969. Um, many years I was pastored, I was mentored by Pastor Z.B. Duncan, as I stated before. I spent five years ministry in Southern Illinois, 10 years ministry in Monroe, North Carolina, and 30 years uh, in Front Royal, Virginia. I retired in 2015, and we moved to North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and I took a six-year vacation at the beach. We wondered in 2021 if we might have one more adventure in us, <laughs> Rachel and I did, and we decided to move back home anyhow. <laughs> and so here we are. I invite you to my website. is introducing you. What, no, it's behind me. Um, I invite you to my website. I, I'm sorry for that interruption. Uh, God has a plan.net. Uh, in this study, uh, I will be referencing from the book or from the Bible, of course, and from a book entitled The Millennial Maze by Stanley J. Grins. Uh, he Ask, when will Jesus return? Question we all ask, isn't it? But we ask, before: will it be before or after the millennium? Will there be a millennium? If so, what will it be like? Stanley assesses the strengths and weaknesses of the four, well, I guess, major evangelical positions. Post-millennialism, dispensational dispensational premillennialism, get your tongue around that, historic premillennialism, and amillennialism. Myself, I have an amillennialism background of many years ago when I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> what it, and uh, that I was, that's where I was standing. I was only a teen, by the way. I started out as an Advent Christian on the seventh day, I began to see, with the help of Revelation 20, two resurrections separated by a thousand years with many shades of the historical approach in those days. Then after struggling many year, years with the many issues, as a church of God and Abrahamic faith pastor, regarding what might be going on during those thousand years, I began to deal more honestly with prophecies in the Old Testament, which, as I see it, can only find a place in the concept of the thousand-year millennium. Now, that's the way I see it. I'm not at all afraid of that word just because it's not in the Bible. Um, my Advent friends use the word Advent all the time, and my Trinity friends use Trinity all the time, neither of which are in the Bible. I know well Peter's thousand years 
that he talked about in 2 Peter 3 8, and Moses' thousand years that he talked about in Psalm 94, and the fact that the oldest man in the Bible was Methuselah, who lived 969, just 31 years shy of 1,000 years, of 10,000 years, or of 1,000 years, excuse me. I find it very difficult to make the jump from those verses to say that the millennium in Revelation 20 has nothing to do with time at all. Uh, be honest with you, to me, when it says they came to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years, and this is the first resurrection, and that the rest of the dead live not until the thousand years are finished, resurrection number two, if I can add that much, being an accountant, I should be, and that the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, will be bound for a thousand years and will not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years are completed. And after the thousand years are completed, the dragon, who is the devil and Satan, will be loosed, be loosed out of his imprisonment and go out to deceive the nations who are in the four corners of the earth. I choose not, friends to add to those words or to take away from those words. If I'm wrong for believing those words, just as they're written, how can I be held to account for believing the Bible just as it says? Slide number three. A basic thrust, and I'm referring now to to the um, uh, Millennial Maze book I was talking about. And I will frequently in this presentation. And um, uh, you, you'd be welcome. It would be beneficial for you to read it and have in your library. A basic thrust, he says, of the eschatological orientation of the New Testament as it builds from the Old Testament seeks to mediate to the people of God insight and to the significance of the age in which we're living, such insight arises as the present is viewed in the light of God who is sovereign over history. Um, it is he, Daniel said, who changes the times and the epochs and removes kings and establishes kings. He it is who can make known what will take place in the future, Daniel 2.21. This insight, of course, was given to Daniel. You know, he does nothing unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. And to the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, and to that generation as well, to all generation, God's intention to smite the statue of world dominions spoken of in chapter 2 of Daniel. On the feet of the iron, the clay, the, and crush them. That's verse, chapter 2, verse 34 and 45. Verse 35, it says, This kingdom which God will set up by the stone cut out of the mountain without hands will crush and put an end to all kingdoms of men and will itself endure forever. That's verse 44. That so expressed in the Lord's prayer, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Matthew 6, 13. A panorama of the nature of the biblical teaching concerning the reign of God may bring this aspect of eschatology into a clearer focus, if you will. The conclusion of the drama of salvation history must speak of the consolidation of the universal rule of God on earth. Remember, thine is the kingdom. Remember, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Thy kingdom come, your kingdom come. The time when the Lord at Yahweh's right hand will strike through kings, that's Psalms 110, verse 5, and ultimately abolish all rule and authority and reign till he has put all enemies under his feet and then subject himself to him who subjected all things to him so that God then will be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. 
Paul said, then comes the end. Till we get to there, we can't say the end has come. For he, the Lord Messiah, will abolish all rule and authority and hand over the kingdom to the God and Father. Here it is, Father. I have done what you told me to do. Here it is in its perfection. After the last enemy is destroyed, which is death. Slide number four, please. Eschatology. The doctrine of last things. Eschatos, Greek means farthest or last. Pardon my mispronunciation at times. Logos, Greek means word or study. Eschatology is what is ultimate or last, what is final in God's program. Now, I don't know if you thought about it or not. I hadn't until I kind of looked at this uh, from um, the uh, Millennial Maze uh, uh, point of view. Eschatology surveys what lies beyond for individual human life. Eschatology researches death and life after death. Talking about what is eschatology. Eschatology also concerns what is final for corporate human history. Corporate human history. That's everybody. Eschatology studies how God will bring human history to a climax and how that goal is already at work in the present. Eschatology also inquires as to what is final with respect to the cosmos in its entirety. Think about that. Eschatology speaks of the way in which God's activity in the universe is being moved toward its intended goal in the eternal reality that lies beyond the flow of history. Eschatology provides an overarching vision of faith. Christianity finds itself unable to articulate, however, with one voice, a message of astrological hope for the world. Slide number five, please. For one thing, the message of going to heaven when you die does not square with Martha's hope for her brother Lazarus, who had died. Her hope, simply put, was, I know that he will rise again. When? in the resurrection at the last day, John eleven twenty three. 23. Jesus' response, simply put, you need to know that I am the resurrection and the life. The person who dies believing in me as Lazarus did will live again. Yes, the resurrection at the last day, simply put. Jesus had addressed that clearly by the sheep gate called Bethesda, where he healed a man who had been diseased for 38 years. He told the Jews who were very upset that he healed on the Sabbath day, the dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man, who the Father has was giving to have life in himself. Even as the Father has life in himself and can convey that life to another person or persons and to execute judgment. God conveyed that authority to his son. Those dead who have done good deeds, Jesus said in John 5, will come forth in the resurrection of life, while those having done evil deeds will come forth in the resurrection of judgment. If that ain't two resurrections, I can't count. John 5, 28, 29. These dead ones, Jesus said, would come forth from their tombs and those who believe in me and are living on that last day will never die. And say, well, how do you get that? Hang with me just a little bit. Revelation eleven fifteen 15 
is a prophecy of the seventh trumpet. This trumpet will be accompanied by a loud voice coming from heaven, saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. That reminds me so much of Daniel 2, just in Daniel 7. Those living in Christ, those who are in Christ and are living when at his parousia will, as Paul said, be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the sounding of the trumpet, no doubt the seventh trumpet, Revelation eleven fifteen, when the kingdom of this, the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, his Messiah. This is when the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout. Now I'm going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 17. The voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Paul said, then the dead in Christ will rise first, indicating that Paul perfectly understood that what Jesus told Martha, which is why Paul said, those who are alive and remain unto the parousia of the Lord, the coming, the parousia of the Lord, those who are still living when the Lord comes and will join him, but not before those who have already died. I'll not perceive them that are asleep. But will together with those dead in Christ who rise first, think about that, be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and will thereafter be with the Lord forever. That's verse 15 and 17. This eschatological hope was shared by Jesus to Martha it was shared by Paul to the Thessalonians and by Jesus in Revelation 20, but finds but a few believers today. Even though it is the hope of those who believed in him in ages past, him who is the resurrection and the life. Paul referred to the last trump, which will sound when a group will be changed from perishable to imperishable in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. There he makes the point Jesus made, that we shall not all sleep. See, those who are living, believe in me, will never die. We shall not all sleep. Those who believe in me are living, who are living on the last day will never die. Jesus, which what Jesus told Martha. Notice that in Revelation eleven fifteen said that that day when the seventh trumpet sounds accompanied by a loud voice from heaven, proclaiming the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord God and of his Lord Messiah, who will awaken those who are sleeping in death, the dead in Christ, who will rise first. The only ones who will rise from the dead at the parousia, as I understand it, will be the dead who are in Christ. That's what Paul said. And all those will be changed from perishable to imperishable. All those resurrected at that parousia will be changed from perishable to imperishable. Read it for yourself. Paul made that very plain in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, when he said, those who belong to Christ at his parousia. Those who belong to Christ at his parousia. Only those who belong to Christ at his parousia. That's why Paul in these resurrection comments makes it so very plain that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom inaugurated at the sounding of the trumpet of God, the seventh, the last of the seven trumpets. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Those who are in Christ, but there is an order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, and note this carefully, underline it in your Bible in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 23. Those who are Christ at his parousia. 
These are the ones Paul told the Thessalonians about, the dead in Christ, which rise first, and those in Christ who are alive and remain until his parousia. Not until that happens can the end come. The end is when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, but not until after he has put down all enemies under his feet, which also includes the destruction of death, the last enemy to be destroyed, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Grins postulates on the surface the millennium focus on, focuses on how the thousand-year vision of the apocalypse fits into the overarching program of the coming of the reign of God. Your kingdom come, Matthew 16. Think about that. Let me read it one more time. On the surface, the millennium, the thousand-year reign, focuses on how the thousand-year vision of the apocalypse fits into the overarching program of the coming of the reign of God. Is the millennium a further stage after the second advent that contributes to the transition from the present age to the age to come, as the premillennialism camp teaches? Didn't the prophets seem to agree with that chronology, if you will? It seems to me that amillennialism does not take into account those prophecies by the prophets on which the New Testament writers based their prophecies. Slide six, please. If you would examine this perspective with me, if you dare, would that you would take a good look at these prophetic promises given by God and uttered by the prophets as we go and as we go, ask yourself these three questions. Have these prophecies in these scriptures, which we'll get into later, been fulfilled? If not, will they find future fulfillment? And if they will, when? There must be, friends, there must be a fulfillment of those prophecies given by the prophets. Let's look at Zechariah's prophecy in Luke chapter 1, verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. And this, Jesus hadn't even died yet, but he's talking about it as though it already happened and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. And it, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. It's easy to go through here and there and everywhere and forget about what the prophet said. Don't do that. You can't do that. Salvation, he said, Zacharias did, from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Those are words spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets from of old. Don't overlook what they said. Peter's second prophetic sermon following Pentecost in Acts 3, 20 through 21, the Christ appointed for you whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. There again, do not. Do not fail to look at those prophecies. If your prophetic understanding does not incorporate what the prophet said, it is at best incomplete. Moses also prophesied of these days. And this we're looking at in Acts. Listen to what he said. 
the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. You never, you didn't think of Moses as a prophet, did you? Yes, he was. Jesus as a prophet, yes, he is. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Now, how do you look at that? Utterly destroyed from among the people. Look at verse 24. And likewise, Peter said, all the prophets who have spoken, where do you think these apostles got information that they were sharing with people? They went back to the prophets. Likewise, all the prophets who have spoken, even from Samuel and his successors on, onward, also announced these days. Slide number seven, please. What did the prophets prophesy? Isaiah 126, I will restore judges and counselors as at the first. Zion, Jerusalem, will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Have these prophecies in Isaiah been fulfilled? If not, will they find future fulfillment? And if they will, when, and if it doesn't fit into your prophetic understanding, it, your prophetic understanding is not as complete as it can be. Isaiah chapter 2. The mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the chief of the mountains, and all nations will flow into it. Has that happened? Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Many peoples, in verse 3, he says, many nations will come and say, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. I wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with that for years until I finally decided, friend, I'm just going to believe what it says. And if what it says plainly is what I should understand, then that's what I'm going to believe. Verse 3, the law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The Lord will judge, he says in verse 4, between the nations. And look at this word, people, mediate for many peoples. If the only ones that are left on the earth will be the saints, why is the Lord going to have to mediate for those people? You mean they can't get along? Look at verse 4 again. Distant nations and compared to uh, Israel, America is a distant nation, will hammer their swords, and we've got a lot of them, into plowshares and their spears. Mercy, we've got a bunch of those into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up a sword against nation. The nations will no longer train for war. Verse 4. I ask you, have those prophecies been fulfilled? Will they? When? If you don't have a space for it in your theological and astrological understanding, then you need to make a place for it because that's the way it's going to be according to the prophets. A time when Isaiah said in verse six, the wolf will dwell with the lamb. When the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. Chapter two, verse 11, verse 17. Let's go to Isaiah 11. <laughs> The leopard will lie down with the goat, Isaiah 11, 6. Has that happened? The calf, the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little boy shall lead them. 
the lion will eat straw like the ox. Verse 7. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. Verse 7. Isaiah 11. Has it happened? The nursing child will play on the hole of the cobra. The weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. That's verse 8 of chapter 11. They will not hurt. Oh, hallelujah. Or destroy in all my holy mountain. Has it happened yet? Is it going to? The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. No, it hasn't happened. Yes, it will happen. And it's going to happen after Jesus comes and during a special time known as the millennium. Isaiah 32, Isaiah said, a king shall reign in righteousness. Isaiah 32, 1. Uh, I think it is a stretch to say that is talking about Jesus' reign today. Princes shall rule in judgment. Are you ruling in judgment today? Are you a prince of the king? Think about it. Look at Isaiah chapter 65. In a time that leads up to the new heavens, the new earth, when God will rejoice in Jerusalem, the voice of weeping and the sound of crying will be no longer. Verses 17 and 18. Listen to this. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. Listen to this. For the youth will die at the age of 100 and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought of cursed. Isaiah 65, 20. Has it happened? Will it happen? When will it happen? I wrestled with this for years and years until I finally had to say, well, dear Lord, if that's what you're going to do, well, hallelujah. They will not build and another inhabit. Verse 22. They will not plan and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people, and my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. That's verse 22. And then again, he says in verse 25, chapter 65 of Isaiah, the wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food, and they will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. No, that has not been fulfilled. Yes, it most definitely will be fulfilled. When? When the Lord comes and establishes his rulership and reigns amongst his enemies. Yes. Micah chapter 4. The mountain of the Lord's house, mm, sounds just about like what we read about in Isaiah chapter 2, doesn't it? Will be established. I wonder why. Here we have it twice. Must be very important. As the chief of the mountains and all nations will flow into it. All nations. Many peoples will come and say, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. That's verse two. The Lord will judge between the nations and mediate for many peoples. You can't be talking about it. the saints. Why is he going to have to mediate between us? If he has to mediate between us, I, I don't think we're going to make it, folks. The Lord will judge between the nation and mediate for many peoples. Verse three. Distant nations will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation, verse 3, will not lift up sword against nation. The nations will no longer train for war. And verse 4, many people in distant nations will be able to sit under their vine and under their fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. Wow. 
the Lord, in verse 7, will reign on Mount Zion from now on and forever. Well, listen to what Habakkuk the prophet said in chapter 2, verse 14. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. Listen to what David said. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. That's Psalm 46, verse 9. David's Lord will rule in the midst of his enemies. That's Psalm 110, verse 2. Have, I, again I ask, these prophecies been fulfilled? If they have not, will they find fulfillment? And if they will, when? Should we not expect a fulfillment of these prophecies, which God moved his prophets to prophesy. Okay, I hope I didn't scare you too bad with that. Okay, we want to go to slide number eight. Stephen Grins calls the kingdom of God, and I had never thought of it this way, God's intervention in human affairs, God's powerful invasion of the world itself. And this knowledge demands a radical decision on your part and on my part. As individuals, we want to have a future unending existence in that reign of God, which we pray for when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this should help us understand why John, Jesus, and the apostles heralded the words, repent for the kingdom of God's at hand. The consummation of that message awaits the glory surrounding Christ's second advent. Right out of his book. This message began to be reinterpreted as something to do with the private realm of the inner spirit of the individual believer. Grins posits a sometimes following the 1920s, he said, re, there was a reevaluation regarding the end of the world, which no longer gets understood in terms of human history, but a change to faith within the heart of the hearer of the proclamation. So the expectation of a golden age for mankind thousand years, a millennium, then became spiritual victory enjoyed in the present. Thus, the millennial hope became more about living the victorious life in the victorious Christian life. Okay. Uh, that doesn't sound like a bad thing, does it? Slide nine, please. As a matter of fact, it may sound like a good trade-off. But remember Jesus' warning to any and all who hear these prophecies in Revelation. It spoke to me so loudly I couldn't, I couldn't hear anything else. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy. God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. That's Revelation 22, 18. If I treat, and I'm thinking about myself, if I treat Revelation 20, 1 through 10, in a way Jesus described at the very end of the book, by adding to or taking away, it, it begins to stand out, at least in my mind, as a personal gotcha. If I mishandle the things written in the book of Revelation by adding to or taking away from those words, I'm afraid that I maybe perhaps sometimes forgot Peter's words. Know this first, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. 
Know this, first of all, that no prophecy, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own private interpretation. Own interpretation, excuse me. How many times have I heard it said, well, that my interpretation. Oh, my goodness. You know, that's not what it's about. Why might that be? For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. God had a message. He wanted us to understand. He has a message. for. He wants us to understand, and he wants us to understand it like he said it, not like we think it is. Think that's hard? Huh? You just have to take it up with John, and he did. Slide number 10, please. In his book, um, Stanley uh, Grimm's quotes Moltmann, Jurgen Moltmann, he said he warns us to not misunderstand this central biblical thing i.e. eschatology, he said, needs to be directed toward a God who will do a new work on behalf of the world in the future and thereby inspires hope in the present. He argued for the central orientation of the Bible as the history book of God's promises. Oh boy, I really like that. A good look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, David, the prophets, etc., to authenticate that assertion. Paul spoke of those promises, chapter 26 of Acts 6 to 8, the promise made by God to the fathers, the promise which caught the attention, he said, of the 12 tribes and which they hoped to attain. Paul upbraided those Jews. Why? Why? Is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? The writer of Hebrews said that Abraham believed in the resurrection of the dead, Hebrews eleven nineteen. Job believed, looked forward to his resurrection, Job nineteen twenty six. David believed in a resurrection of the dead, Acts two twenty seven. Isaiah believed in a resurrection, Isaiah twenty six nineteen. Daniel believed in a resurrection. Daniel 12, 2, God preached the resurrection to Moses. In Exodus 3, 6, Jesus said in Matthew 22, 31, 32. The promissory history will give better direction to our present day mission. We should look forward or look beyond, if you will. Yes, the great tribulation of Daniel 12, 1, and Matthew 12, 24, 21, to the golden age to follow. For it is, listen to this, immediately after that time of great distress, when they shall see the Son of Man appear in the clouds of heaven. The future comes to us out of divine reality, he said, and as a divine gift, it is not that which is already pregnant in the present. Rather than moving from the present to the future, we must look from the future to the present and anticipate the future in the midst of our present existence. I think I ought to read that again. The future comes to us out of the divine reality and as the divine gift. It is not that which is already pregnant in the present. Rather than move from the present to the future, we must look from the future to the present and anticipate the future in the midst of our present existence. Peter said, the day of the Lord will come. What sort of people are you to be in 2 Peter 3, 10, 11? Jesus spoke of that day in Luke 17, 24. So will the Son of Man be in his day. Jesus will inaugurate that day by his appearing in power and great glory. This is the day of the Lord Jesus, which Jesus referred to and which was referred to by Paul in 2 Corinthians 1.14. Here's 
who reminded the Thessalonians that the day of the Lord has not yet come, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2. He encouraged the Philippians to hold fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ, we would have reason to glory. You see, a promise is a pledge that proclaims a reality which is not yet at hand. The promise concerning God's future is present as the proclaimed word, the gospel of the kingdom of God about the future. A new future, which we must see. That future must break into the present and transform. The golden age will at the proper time arrive. It can then be as Isaiah said, and it shall be said in that day, behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that we might that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Isaiah 25, verse 9. Somebody said, well, that proves that, that Jesus is God. No, it doesn't prove any such thing. It proves that as God's representative, when Jesus, does, Jesus appears in the clouds of heaven, we're going to look up and say, truly God is fulfilling his precious, wonderful promises. Then the Lord will establish he who is the one who he made Lord and Christ to rule in the midst of his enemies. Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. He is the one whose strong scepter, David said, the Lord will stretch from Zion. Slide number 11, please. Among the areas dividing the Christian ranks, few have been as explosive as those surrounding eschatology. The curtain of history will be brought down by nothing less than the glorious return of the risen and exalted Lord Jesus. One central point of disagreement involves the meaning of the thousand-year reign of Christ, Revelation 20, and hence the expectation of a future millennial kingdom. Some feel that Revelation 20, 1 through 8, deals with the golden age anticipated by the prophets and more specifically the thousand year period envisioned by the seer in Revelation 20. How are we to understand the vision of the thousand year reign of the blessed followers? What is the meaning of the word millennium? In Latin, M-I-L-L-E -L -L -E means thousand. A millennium means a thousand years. Aren't we now living at the beginning of the third millennium since the birth of Christ, as it were? Slide number 12, please. You see, the central debate among evangelicals focuses on three issues. I'm no theologian, folks. I'm just a, somebody that the Lord called to preach the gospel. I'm just trying to help us all uh, not become prophets herself, uh, but to be ready when the Lord Messiah comes and to expect what's next, what's coming down the road. There are at least three issues. The nature of the millennial reign, the relationship between the visible reign of Christ and the thousand years, and the time of the return of Christ relative to the millennium. I'm going to go over a few things very uh, kind of briefly. I, I, think, uh, I think it would be good. And I'm going to uh, read some uh, information from... I don't know if you've ever used chatai.com, chatai.com, and it, it, I'm, I'm using their definitions here. Postmillennialism is a form of Christian eschatology that teaches that the world will gradually be transformed by the spread of the gospel and that the second coming of Christ will occur after a period of peace and prosperity, commonly known as the millennium. According to post-millennialism, the church is re 
responsible for spreading the gospel to every corner of the earth and for working to transform society in accordance with Christian principles. This work, it is believed, will lead to a period, this work will lead to a period of global peace and justice and ultimately paved the way for the second coming of Christ. Post-millennialism was particularly popular during the 19th century, but has fallen out of favor with many Christians. The second coming of Christ would then be post-millennial, after the millennium. Okay. Amillennialism. All right, I think um, we lost Pastor Baldwin for a minute there. Not sure what happened. I think his connection dropped, maybe. So we'll give some time to see if, if he returns. <laughs> Just froze there. Okay, so this is his website, by the way. God has a plan. He had a couple more slides to go. Yep, so his connection dropped. So I'll just, we'll wait for him a little bit. So godhasaplan.net, and uh, you can contact the pastor there. Just click on contact, and he has a lot of material on this site. Let me see. He also has online studies. So if you're interested in online fellowship, uh, let's see. Yep, just uh, contact him through this website. And uh, let's see, what else? By the way, I, I saw a question online. Actually, let me, while we wait a, a while, I'll do some uh, of the comments, good comments he is getting. Hold on, let me make this bigger. Uh, Dennis is such an inspiration, no retiring from a calling and God's kingdom service. And uh, Dennis looks great. <laughs> I could listen to him forever soothing sounds of Pastor Baldwin. Uh, yes, he's a very good speaker, says Trudy. And Michelle says, these are very descriptive verses to help us understand what the world will be like when Jesus is in charge of the government and we are his, his team, on his team. Yep, that's uh, exactly right. And uh, good verses there from the prophets. I'll just sh show one of the ones he used, which is the famous Isaiah 2. Let's see. So this is a prophecy concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. As the highest of the mountains shall be raised above the hills, all the nations shall string to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So his point was obviously that these words uh, are yet to be fulfilled. This has not happened yet. The world is not at peace, if anything, is getting worse. And the prophets also say it will get worse. 
So that's a good passage there of scripture. All right, let's see. Just giving some time here to see if we can get him back. Uh, just navigate his website here a little bit. Uh, let's see the coming age. So he has a section here on this topic of the coming age. Uh, let's have a look at no more death. That works. Oh, okay. That's not working. All right, there we go. So he's got a nice, it almost looks like a pamphlet. And uh, so we can look at that. Resurrection life. Conditional immortality. So he's done a lot of work, Pastor Baldwin. And uh, you can, sh I'm sure you can share all this. By the way, if you want a copy of uh, his PowerPoint, the one he's presenting right now, uh, let me know. Send me an email. I can get it to you. And he can get it to you as well, I'm sure. So, <clears throat> Okay. So, yes, he's having internet problems, he says. He's trying to reconnect. And... Uh, like I said, only a few slides left on his presentation. So if you can bear with us. Let's see, while we wait, let me see. Let me play you one of our videos. So the prophets, so the pastor here is showing you what the prophet, Old Testament prophets are saying. Obviously, New Testament prophets as well and they talk about two things as Anthony teaches it's a sort of uh, one message with two parts it's very bad <laughs> very very bad but it will get better so I call it destruction and reconstruction so let me play this uh, short clip while we wait here for the pastor to return
So that's uh, the uh, <laughs> the prophets. That's what they talk about. The great and terrible day of the Lord. But at the end comes uh, salvation. And uh, I'm reminded of Joel chapter 2, very famous prophecy. And you see here they, this contrast, this two-tone message, if you will. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like the first words out of the mouth of Jesus himself. The kingdom of God is at hand. So the kingdom is always near. Never here, as Pastor Baldwin was saying. So I think we have the pastor back here. So you there, Pastor? I'm here. <laughs> Great. All right. Let's let's uh, bring this one home. I don't know what caused it to go off, but anyhow, it did. Uh, if you would go down to to uh, uh, slide number 14, and I'll get to the conclusion, okay? Number 14. There we go. Okay, ready? Well, uh, actually, you do have time. If you'd like to talk about this slide, I'm, if you don't mind, you do okay. have time. So okay. if you can do the, uh, slide 13, that looks very interesting. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Hold on, hold on. Okay. Um, Premillennialism uh, which you can see in, in this chart the Lord returns before the thousand year reign. That's premillennialism before the thousand year period of Revelation 20. Christ's coming is premillennial or before the millennium. Okay. Jesus will be physically present on the earth to exercise world dominion, ruling in the midst of his enemies during that thousand years. The period of a thousand years will be marked by goodness, as we read from the prophets earlier. Relative absence of evil. Satan will be restrained. Um, uh, and they, uh, that, that, that's a little bit of that. Now, there is some, um, some folks that hold to the historic premillennialism, which is a form of Christian eschatology that similar to premillennialism, but differs in that it does not necessarily see the thousand-year reign of Christ as a literal period of time. Instead, it emphasizes the idea that the present age is characterized by the general apostasy of the church and that the return of Christ will initiate a period of tribulation to be followed by the visible reign of Christ. It also emphasizes the importance of the restoration of Israel and God's ultimate plan for the world. Historic premillennialism has been associated with the teachings of many early church fathers as well as some Protestant theologians of the Reformation era. And that comes from uh, uh, Chat A.I. Uh, this variety has been around since the early church fathers. It anticipates a time of tribulation directed against the church. And this time of tribulation will be climaxed by Christ's coming. That's what historic premillennialism says. And the millennium will be a time for God to Bless Christ's followers, according to what uh, they said. Now, if I could, let's go to slide number 14. Now, do the coming of Christ, the parousia, and the resurrection of all humankind, together with the eschatological judgment and the inauguration of the eternal kingdom of God, occur as one grand event or are they separated by a messianic rule lasting a thousand years does the eternal kingdom of god come as a catastrophic end to the human history in an unmediated 
fashion? Or are we to expect an interregnum of a thousand years, a golden age on earth? How does the millennial vision of Revelation 20 fit together with the transformation of the Jewish expectation for a temporal messianic kingdom into the New Testament emphasis on the present kingship of the Messiah? Jesus the Messiah. How, did, how does all that fit together? Okay, does the vision in Revelation 20, that's some questions that can be logically asked. Does the vision in Revelation 20 have significance to the Christian faith or should that significance be dismissed? It seems of utmost importance as we consider the question of the millennialism that we are engaged in a debate concerning the climax of human history. Folks, understand in terms of God's intention for his creation, should we relegate the climax of human history to the fringes of the biblical proclamation? Okay, that's some questions that, that this writer asked. The scriptures as a whole assert that God's program is directed to the bringing about of a redeemed people living within a redeemed creation. Isaiah 11, 9, Habakkuk 2, 14. The Bible presents history as directed toward the goal of the reign of God or the presence of the will of God throughout the earth. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. That's what we're moving toward. And the biblical story reaches its climax with the grand vision of the new heaven and the new earth which we must be reminded was anticipated not only by Revelation, but by Old Testament prophets, such as Isaiah in chapter 65 and many others. Revelation presents an eon beyond the present that will mark the completion of the divine program in human history. The future new order will be characterized by reconciliation and harmony. Its citizens will live in fellowship with each other, with creation, and most importantly, with God. The new order in Revelation is pictured as a, now notice this, as a human society. There's a city, folks. There's a city. Nature will again fulfill its purpose of providing nourishment for its inhabitants. There's the tree of life. There's, there's so many things that, have, that relate us to human society. The consummation of human history lies at the heart of concern, the concern of the Bible. The consummation of human history lies there. God's ultimate intention is not directed toward the transpositioning of the individual believer to an isolated individual realm of unending life beyond the world of time and stars. His program focuses on the corporate human story and therefore on humans as potential participants in a society in the coming age. Consequently, the goal of human history is the replacement of the earthly empires which are in the service of Satan with the eternal kingdom of God. So what then is the issue? Bible eschatology asserts that history is meaningful because it is directed toward an end, a goal, if you will, that lies at its conclusion and gives meaning to everything else. The Christian faith boldly asserts the up, unparalleled claim that this climatic goal of history is already known for it has been disclosed before the end in Jesus of Nazareth, the, the Messiah, if you will. Because of this, we live with assured confidence concerning the outcome of history and our, my participation in the eternal reign of God. Thy kingdom come, Jesus taught us to pray. Thy will be done. He will straighten everything out and turn it all over to his Father that God may be all in all. The Christian has tasted the goodness of the eternal kingdom of God through Hebrews 6, 5, tasting the good word of God. That's the gospel of the kingdom and the powers of the age to come. Can we not say that since the ascension of Christ, the world has been living in the last days? 
John the Apostle concluded such in 1 John 2, 18 and 2 John 7. Even now we know it is the last hour because even now there are many antichrists. We don't know exactly what that means, but we know that that's what it says. As believers who understand God's future intentions for us, believers, and for the world and for the cosmos, we proclaim that God's word, the gospel of the kingdom in the present, for we realize that God's future has implications for our life, for my life, for your life today, and for the age to come. According to Mark, the central thrust of Jesus' message focused on the proper response of his hearers in view of the action of God. In other words, the kingdom of God is near, repent, and believe the gospel of the kingdom. Mark 1.15. Now, concluding with these thoughts, we are now at a crucial junction in history. God is acting to assert his claim to rulership. Therefore, we must turn from our sins and believe in the gospel of the kingdom of God. Eschatology, that we begin with, issues a call to response in the present, in the light of God's future. Eschatology issues a call to response in the present, in the light of God's future. Eschatology is then a call to holiness and right living. The New Testament sounds the alarm concerning the end of history and the eschatological judgment. The message is not intended so much to offer data for charts and depicting the chronology of future events, but to produce proper conduct in the present. God's grace is a teaching grace and teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present as we look for the appearing of the glory of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope that some of that got, got, got through. Uh, sorry for the interruption. I don't know. My, um, my, my system just went out completely. But uh, uh, I don't let's see. I think. Premillennialism is a form of Christian eschatology that teaches a literal thousand-year reign of Christ on earth before the final judgment and end of the world. According to this understanding, Christ will return to the earth and establish his kingdom. Daniel 2, first, the first phase is the smiting of the image of Daniel upon the feet. Then if you'll notice carefully, he said, then was the iron, the clay, the gold, the silver, the brass, broken to pieces, get this, together. So there has to be a time at the beginning when the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of God, if you will. And then there has to come a time beyond that when all that was before the toes of that image, all that was before it, the head, and the arms, and the belly, and the thigh, and all of that, the legs, is dealt with. There must be a time, and I haven't even got got into the idea that the Bible talks about giving account for every idle word. I can't get over It's going to take time. We argue about a thousand years. We argue about the other different things. It's going to take time to give account for the people of the world. And uh, so uh, it's, this is referred to as the millennium. Christ will return to the earth to establish his kingdom, during which time he will reign over the world from Jerusalem. So, well, that can't be. Why not? God can do it any way he wants to. This happens to be, according to what I understand, in the Bible, what he has revealed to us 
hey, I won't do anything if I don't tell my prophet. Okay, he told his prophet. His prophets told us. So what are we going to do with it? This is often referred to as the millennium. Premillennialists believe that the present age is one of tribulation, and there is to be, according to Daniel and according to Jesus, a great time of distress, a time of great tribulation. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, Jesus said, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and they shall see the Son of Man coming, the clouds. Present age is the one of tribulation, and the return of Christ will mark the beginning of a new age of righteousness and peace, if you will. This view is based on a literal interpretation of biblical prophecies, particularly those found in both in the prophets, if you will, and in the book of Revelation. Okay, Carlos, that's uh, kind of concludes what I had. No, that's uh, that's uh, good good stuff there, Pastor Baldwin. I had shared uh, while you were disconnected there some messages from online. Oh. Okay. But they really do appreciate you, and we appreciate you, and thank you once again for all your work this year at this year's conference. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm so sorry that, that I had no control over it. I don't know I don't know what happened. I had to re unplug everything and plug it back in. You know how you do it. Yep, and no problem. It, it's hard to do that when you're live, but you got to sometimes. <laughs> That's right. We'll just blame Satan. Okay. Thanks, Pastor. Uh -huh. God bless. So you. that's Pastor Baldwin there. And this is his website. Once again, GodHasAPlan.net. If you'd like to contact Pastor Baldwin, just click on contact. He has a little contact form there, as you can see. And uh, I'm sure he will also be happy to send you the PowerPoint he, he worked on uh, this morning. Very good PowerPoint there. I like that, especially that one. That looks very simple to me and biblical. So, so uh, thanks was once again. All right, so that's it, folks, for this year's theological conference. Another year. Um, I think it's the thirty second. That's what they're telling me. Although. <laughs> um, I've said different years before, I think. So, okay, so we will wrap it up here with Anthony, and uh, he will come on and just thank everyone again for all their service to the conference and obviously to the to the Great Commission as a whole. And Anthony will also f close with prayer. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning, Carlos. Thank you. And to, of course, to Dennis <clears throat> for all of that good work. And so it is now my opportunity to thank everybody who put a lot of work into this conference. It is indeed, I think, the 32nd conference. We began in 1991 <clears throat> at the suggestion of Kent Ross, the late Kent Ross, and I'm grateful to him for starting that. Perhaps another year we will meet face to face. I don't know how that will work out, but this miracle of technology that we've been using, and it was almost supernatural that some, something intervened to prevent Dennis from finishing his speech there. But of course, he did recover power. And that was, may I say, one of the most splendid occasions for the propagation of the gospel of the kingdom. I'd like to to offer our audience, our brothers and sisters out there, a challenge. Why not take some of your precious time in this coming year, starting right away, and talk to the Billy Graham Association, Franklin Graham. They're very friendly. They will invite comments from you and simply say to them, I don't hear you using the phrase gospel of the kingdom. Do you realize that that famous term, which is the core and the heart of everything that drove Jesus with a passion to accomplish his preaching, Luke 4.43, I hope you know it, 
The Billy Graham Association needs to hear from you, from all of us, in a very gentle and respectful way, that they would talk about the gospel of the kingdom. And you could remind them even that uh, C.S. Lewis, the very famous uh, Christian writer, says something really horrifying when he says that the gospel is not found in the gospels. What? I hope that makes you tremble and we need to press on then to try to help and uh, correct in a gentle and respectful way this horrible, shocking absence of the phrase gospel of the kingdom, which as Dennis so well laid out for us, is God having a plan. I learned nothing in the Church of England except that if I was good, I would go to heaven when I die. And the Billy Graham Association is still offering me heaven at death. All of that is wrong. It's false. You're being lied to if your leader is telling you that when you die, you go to heaven. So there's much work to be done. And I hope that this conference will have encouraged you to get busy in various ways as you can and have the fun of changing the minds of other people. So let me say thank you to all those who spoke this year <coughs> for the excellence of their presentations, and especially to Carlos, my son-in-law, who kept all of this going with the miracle of technology for which we're so thankful that God has given us talented people who can operate this system by which we can speak to each other face to face by film. So thanks to Carlos for all the work that he kept going so smoothly, intervening to show us clips when the system failed. There he was providing excellent information for us to fill in the time. Everything went very smoothly. So we look forward to another year. Do join us again next year, God willing, if the second coming has not intervened. And I'll remind you then finally, before I pray, uh, to dismiss us all, that Paul spoke about the crown which will be given to every Christian. It's in Second Timothy. God is going to award a crown and don't dismiss that word as some vague philosophical platitude, a crown of glory to all of those who have loved the future coming of Jesus, who are in love with, are passionate about the appearing of Jesus. You'll find that in Second Timothy. There it is. You see, Carlos found that instantaneously. From now on, we'll leave you with this verse. There is reserved for me, for Paul, and for all of you, the crown and perhaps you were watching the coronation of King Charles yesterday, and you will now know what a crown is more vividly than ever. Crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me as reward and as award on that future day. Not only me, Paul, but also all who have longed and loved the second coming. So that is, I think, a good text to end with. And if you will now bow your heads or look up to heaven, whatever is your practice, I'd like to dismiss us all and put us in God's safekeeping until we meet again another year. So pray with me, if you will. Our Father in heaven, we celebrate today with joy for the words that have been spoken to encourage the premillennial coming kingdom of God on the earth, the restoration of the throne of David, the blessed coming of the kingdom of David, as we read in Mark chapter 11, verse 10, which is the only hope for a very despairing and very dispirited world. We pray for that day to come as Jesus commanded us to pray, may your kingdom come soon. We pray for that day when the immortalization of the saints will occur when those who are now sleeping, the sleep of death will arise, as Daniel 12, verse 1 says. We look forward to that day. Give us the strength and the health and the courage to present this gospel of the kingdom, as Matthew 24, 14 says. This gospel about the kingdom of God, including, of course, also the death 
and resurrection of Jesus, which is essential to our belief. We pray that that gospel of the kingdom will make good progress as we set our hearts in various ways to help in the propagation of that prophecy of Matthew 24, verse 14. So these prayers are offered now on behalf of all of those who gathered this year for this uh, 20, what was that, this 32nd annual conference. Thanks to all the work that was done to keep this conference moving smoothly. We praise you for that talent, for the miracle of technology, and we commit and consign these prayers, these petitions, to you and to your son at your right hand. And as always, we're praying in the name of the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony, especially for those kind words. I really do appreciate it. And that is a great verse to end with, that, as you say. Uh, Paul did not have some personal millennium, <laughs> as uh, Pastor Baldwin so excellently presented. There are no personal truths. There's only the truth. And there's no personal millennium. There's only the millennium. There's no invisible appearance, parousia. There is deep parousia. So that's a great verse to end with. Again, thank you so much to everyone who was able to join us live. I know, obviously, we all have lives to live and things to do. But uh, we do thank those who were able to join us live and those who are watching this recording. This has been the Theological Conference once a year, usually around this time in the spring here in the south of Atlanta, Georgia. And we hope to bring this event again to you free online next year, 2024. Wow, time is flying by. Uh, once again, if you go to the links here, go to video, and you'll be able to see the past uh, streams go to live and these are the unedited raw footage if you will <clears throat> uh, that started back in uh, back uh, Cinco de Mayo uh, Friday so you can watch there and please subscribe to the channel if you have not and I try to keep this updated every day with a, a video here a video there also just a quick announcement before we wrap up so this month we have a Q&A once again, a Q&A with Sir Anthony and myself, and you can send your questions uh, ahead of time, by the way, there's my email. We usually do it on a Friday at 7, what is it, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. Um, we don't have a set Friday date I can give you, but it is on Fridays, that's why it's good if you subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can get a update, uh, a notification. But you can send your question ahead of time, carlos at thehumanjesus.org. I'll pass it on to Anthony, and that will help him also address the question you may have. So that is coming up this month. It's once a month. Also, I have, uh, guess what? Yep, you guessed it. <laughs> Another debate. Well, you know me, folks. <laughs> um, I, I'm really looking forward to this. I already talked to Sean Griffin. Some of you might know his channel or ministry is called Kingdom in Context. He's a non-Trinitarian, a Unitarian. Um, <clears throat> but he adheres to the law and he believes that all Christians, uh, irrespective of ethnicity, Jew or Gentile, should be circumcised and obey the law of Moses. Now, that's physical circumcision. So I'm looking forward to this. I, I He invited me, I think, earlier this year on his channel. We had a discussion, and this will be a sort of more formal debate, which is really, I think, services both of us and also the audience better, I think, a, a formal debate. So he'll have an opening, and we'll have a discussion and thanks ahead of time to Tracy, the moderator from uh, KOG Missions. And she's always, uh, when, when she's able to moderate. So thanks, Tracy, for doing this. So that is next Saturday. So 
mark the calendar there, May 13. Really looking forward to this. And also, actually, I need to change that. That's okay. I'll leave that for another day. Anyway, that's another debate later this month. <clears throat> but I'll get the date uh, fixed there. All righty. So that's about it. That is all, folks. And um, yes, so until we meet again, God bless, keep safe.